Chapter 24, fluid electrolyte homeostasis and imbalance. So uh, we're going to talk about abnormalities in body fluid. You know, you get too much or too little body fluids. Uh, their concentrations can be altered by excesses in fluid. You know, like if you have too much fluid, that might dilute out certain, certain solutes. Or if you have too little fluid, it can hyper-concentrate certain, certain solutions in your body. And um, you'll find that this electrolyte composition is also dependent on um, body fluid composition. So like I said, if you have too much body fluid, that can kind of decrease the concentration of electrolytes. And if you have too little, that can increase the concentration through kind of, you know, a loss of that fluid, if that makes sense. Now, it can lead to clinical problems or death, and it can occur as, as a result of many different pathophysiological conditions. So body fluid just return, pertains to water within your body, you guys. And there's really two major body fluid compartments in our body. We have extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. Two-thirds of our body fluid is found within our body cells. You know, our body's made of like approximately 100 trillion cells. Each of those cells is full of cytosol, which is a fluid environment. And two, so two-thirds of our body fluid is actually within our cells. The other one-third is actually extracellular. Now, extracellular fluid includes things like interstitial fluid, plasma, or even fluid in joints, right? Or even like serous fluid. Now, um, this is showing some of the different sources of like fluid gain and loss. We know that fluid can be, you know, you can have fluid intake through the mouth or IV. Um, but fluid loss occurs in a variety of ways. We just talked about earlier how you can get fluid loss from the lungs, right? Because your lungs are kind of a more humid environment. And as you're talking and breathing, you're actually exhaling quite a bit of fluid. In fact, um, since we've been here today, you guys, I know I've been talking that much. Wouldn't be a half. Uh, I've already... I've already drank a liter of this bottle already. I had to go home and refill it. Because talking this much, I lose a lot of body fluid just by breathing, which is interesting. So it's a lot of hot air I'm spitting out. Um, you know, we know that uh, you can also lose fluid through skin. Even if you're not currently sweating, or at least you don't think you're sweating, you're actually sweating a little bit. We call it basal sweat. So you're always sweating just a little bit, which means you're always losing some fluid through your skin. Even if you don't perceive sweat, there's imperceivable sweat called basal sweat, and you can lose fluid that way as well. Okay. Otherwise, if you're sweating too, obviously it's a source of fluid loss. Um, you know, you can have fluid excretion or loss through urine or feces, and um, fluid distribution can also be altered too. Like you might find that uh, you know water inside of your bloodstream might end up being absorbed by your body's tissues, and vice versa. So we'll talk about how fluids get distributed throughout your body as well. So fluids excreted, remember excretion is elimination of wastes. So fluids excreted through urinary tract and bowels, right? So in urinary tract, that's the largest volume of fluid that's excreted. In bowels, you know, you're going to lose some fluid in normal bowel fun function, but you're going to lose a, a lot more fluid with diarrhea. With lungs, you'll see this occurring with exhalation. And in skin, uh, you can lose it through visible sweat and insensible perspiration, which is always occurring. We call this basal sweat. In fact, if you guys have heard of those GSR, galvanic skin resistance tests, which is one of the factors they do for lie detection. Like they don't only measure your heart rate and respiratory rate. They also measure your skin resistance, which is basically measuring how much sweat you're making, right? Even if you think you're not sweating, you are. And that correlates with your sympathetic nervous system activity. So if you become more sympathetically active, you start making more of this imperceivable type of sweat, which actually um, changes your GSR so you can actually measure skin resistance as a function of someone's emotional state. And this is how you can determine whether or not someone's lying, right? Um, otherwise, for people who are really good at lying, they pass lie detector tests. Those are, those are, the, those are like the sociopaths who actually believe their lies, right? Um, so we know that there's some different hormones that alter uh, fluid uh, balance in our body. Things like antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. Do you think these guys, do these, does this promote fluid retention or fluid loss? Retention, right? Antidiuretic hormone means it prevents diuresis. Diuresis is water loss. So ADH prevents water loss by acting on your kidneys and uh, uh, increasing water reabsorption in your kidneys. Aldosterone also acts on your kidneys to increase sodium reabsorption. And, and uh, you know, it's that water follows sodium. <laughs> water follows sodium. Sorry, you guys. I'm laughing. I'm laughing because someone just, someone just came by going really fast down a hill on roller skates and they had a stroller. I was thinking, Dan, that looks really dangerous. 
and then and then someone else recognized it too, and we're like, we just started laughing. <laughs> so aldosterone. Oh, YouTube. Okay, so <laughs> aldosterone acts on the kidneys by increasing sodium reabsorption, also increasing water retention. So although aldosterone acts on sodium directly, it helps increase water reabsorption. And then we have the natriuretic peptides like ANP and BAP. Those were secreted by the atria, like during hypertension. Those actually promote fluid loss by inhibiting sodium reabsorption. So if you don't reabsorb sodium in your kidneys, then water is going to follow that sodium in urine. So you increase urine output with uh, ANP and BNP. So what this is showing you guys is basically like the distribution of fluids in your body normally, right? And it's showing a variety of different pressures. So we know we have capillary osmotic pressure. What's the major factor that influences this pressure? Osmotic pressure of the capillary. Yeah, it's a way to reabsorb water from tissue back into your bloodstream. But what's pulling that water back in? Solutes like albumin. albumin. Nice. So albumin is the major factor here for capillary osmotic pressure. Helps to draw water from tissues back into your bloodstream. Capillary hydrostatic pressure is just blood pressure. Fluid pressure has a tendency to force water out of bloodstream into your tissue. Um, we also have interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, where solutes in your tissue can kind of pull fluid from blood into the tissue. And then interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, where fluid pressure in the tissue can may force fluid back into your bloodstream. In fact, the idea of like pressure socks acts on this pressure right here, right? Like if somebody has edema in their legs and you put on pressure stockings or pressure socks, what that's doing is it's bearing down their tissues, which is increasing interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, which then can force water back into their bloodstream, or at least into lymph, which helps reduce some of the edema that, that may have formed. Okay, Now, uh, across cells, this movement of water is ultimately due to osmosis. Remember, osmosis is a process where water follows solutes. So if you have a lot of solutes inside of a cell, water is going to enter because you have more solutes there. If you have a lot of solutes outside of a cell, water is going to leave right? because water is going to follow those solutes. So under normal circumstances, you should find the same solute concentration intracellularly and extracellularly. That way, there's no like net gain or loss of water between cells, and your cells don't like explode or shrivel. So uh, volume deficit, you guys, is caused by removal of sodium-containing fluid from their body. What this manifests as, knowing that plasma volume correlates with blood pressure, if you start to lose a lot of sodium-containing water from your body, right? either through like urination, defecation, sweating, or exhaling, that can lead to low blood pressure. You can expect then all of the clinical manifestations you'd expect to see then with low blood pressure as a consequence of volume deficit, right, or dehydration. So we're going to see lightheadedness, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension. Which one was this one, you guys? What's orthostatic hypotension? Good, yeah. Low blood pressure from going from a, like a prone to a standing position or sitting to standing position. Good. Or even hypovolemic shock under really extreme circumstances. Like, you know, if, you have, if your blood volume is really low, that, then you can go into shock. Now, volume excess comes from too much uh, water in the body. And you might wonder, well, how do you gain too much water? Well, you can see this from renal failure. If your kidneys fail to excrete urine. You know, you can see this from uh, an excess of intake. Like if you if you have too much water ingestion, you, re you can absorb too much water. That can lead to volume excess. Um, and what this leads to then, you guys, are some of the consequences you'd expect to see with high blood pressure, right? Because if you have fluid overload, you're going to increase your blood volume, which increases blood pressure. So with this, you'll see dyspnea or shortness of breath. This, this comes from pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary edema, again, from pulmonary hypertension. And then neck vein distension, again, from fluid overload, your blood volume is so high that your veins start to distend. Not just the neck veins, you guys, really any vein in the body, but the neck veins are more visible. They're easy to see, right? So you can see distended neck veins. What, where else do we see neck vein distension? With heart failure, right? But what, type, what type of heart failure caused neck vein distension? Right side of heart failure, right? Because the right side of the heart can't pump, pump blood along venous blood starts backing up in the systemic veins, including neck veins. So you saw that jugular venous pulse, jugular vein distension, or just basically neck vein distension in general. Um, in fact, when I was a kid, there was this movie. I, don't, I, can't, I can't find this movie, but I have a memory of this, you guys, uh, where 
it was a movie about like homeless people and right before they're about to die they talk about how you can see like these little this little v on their neck like you could tell oh so and so is about to die because also this v would pop up on their neck as a kid i was really confused about what that meant like why would someone have a v on their neck before they're gonna die well if you think about it with respect to heart failure especially right side of heart failure that would be like the neck vein distension right where the venous blood starts backing up now we're not talking about that here i just had an idea i don't know why i brought that up um <laughs> this is this is coming from volume excess though so you have too much blood in the body due to fluid overload now uh, volume excess can lead to things like hyponatremia. Hyponatremia means low blood sodium, right? If you have fluid overload and you get a lot of water now being absorbed into your bloodstream, you're basically diluting out your blood's sodium content, right? That's causing hyponatremia. So it's a serum, it's a serum sodium concentration below the, the levels of like normal limit right here. Cells will swell, right? Because if you start to dilute the sodium that's in your bloodstream, you're going to find a lot more solutes than inside of your cells, than outside the cell. And what was our catchphrase for osmosis again? Water follows solutes. Good. So if you have a lot more solutes inside your cell, water is going to enter that cell, so your cells are going to swell. right? Not just cells of your bloodstream, but cells of your brain. So hyponatremia can also cause brain cells to swell as well. Now, um, some of the primary causes of hyponatremia could be things like a gain of relatively more water than salt. You know, you hear about people who have like water drinking competitions, or they just start chugging an excessive amount of water, maybe from excessive thirst. And if that water doesn't have a lot of electrolytes in it, like I'd say if it's more just sort of like tap water, you know, there's some electrolytes in tap water, but not a tremendous amount. Um, then what happens then, you guys, is you can start to dilute out your bloodstream, and you can start to dilute those solutes, causing hyponatremia. Or it can come from a, a loss of relatively more salt than water, right? Like if you're somehow losing a lot of salt through a wound or in urine, um, then that can lead to hyponatremia. So we know that sodium is in, involved with uh, action potentials, right? Because the whole depolarization phase of the action potential was due to an influx of sodium. But if you start altering sodium levels in your body, now you're altering action potential activity. So what you can expect to see then are some uh, like neurological symptoms with hyponatremia, um, you know, like malaise, nausea, anorexia. But the reason why you get things like headache and vomiting is that even your brain cells start to swell within the cranium. It causes an increase in intracranial pressure, and that causes the, the headache and vomiting um, that's associated with hyponatremia. So what this slide has shown you guys is basically how those cells swell, right? So basically, if you have more solutes inside of a cell than outside, water is going to rush in. And so when that water rushes into your body's cells, then they all swell up. So water, that, that excess water then, or the loss of sodium, can start to cause water then to be absorbed by your body's cells. Not just your brain, but you know, other body tissues as well. So cells have to swell. If this gets severe enough, you know, these cells can burst. Okay? We consider this type of swelling, though, uh, more of a reversible form of cell injury. So the swelling can reverse as long as sodium levels are reestablished. Okay? Um, otherwise, if, if, if too much water starts to rush in here, these cells can lice or burst open. So hypernatremia is, is uh, you know, high blood sodium, and this causes cells to shrivel, right? Because if you have more sodium outside of a cell than inside, where does the water go then? To the, out, to the outside of the cell, right? So it leaves the inside of the cell enters the interstitial fluid so that all your cells shrivel. What this causes is a thing like thirst. Well, this makes sense because the part of your brain that measures um, you know, the bloodstream, it's called the hypothalamus, if it senses too much sodium in your blood, then that actually stimulates thirst. So it makes sense that hypernatremia makes you thirsty, right? It also induces low urine output, right? Because water follows sodium or solutes. So if you have high sodium in your body, then you have a lower urine output because then you're less likely to lose that water through urine and you're going to retain that water in your bloodstream and body's tissues. Now, due to the shrinkage of brain tissue, this leads to things like confusion, seizures, coma, and possibly even death if it's severe enough. But what's interesting, you guys, is that one of the main treatments for intracranial pressure, like let's say if your brain's starting to swell, one of the main treatments for this is to temporarily induce hypernatremia. 
So if someone's brain is swelling, you can inject hypertonic saline in their bloodstream. So you just give them a little bit more sodium than normal. Then what that sodium does is it once, once it makes it into the brain tissue, it starts to pull water out of that brain tissue. And if you start pulling water out of the brain tissue, then the brain stops swelling as much and it starts to decrease in size. So that's sort of the first protocol for intracranial pressure is to inject um, hypertonic saline and temporarily induce hypernatremia. Not enough to obviously injure the person, but to at least reduce the uh, swelling that's going on in the brain. So that's how it's used uh, clinically. Now, it causes our cells to shrivel, right? Because if you find a lot more sodium outside of the cell than in, then water is going to leave the cell and, and uh, enter the tissue. If your cells shrivel, like in your brain, then your whole brain's going to shrink, right? So that can help reverse some of the swelling that occurs with intracranial pressure. Um, now, <clears throat> edema is just basically a buildup of fluid in the interstitial compartment, and it can be manifested as excess extracellular fluid and volume. Uh, this can come about from increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, right? So if, you, if your blood pressure is too high, and we've learned about this and talked about this consistently, if your blood pressure is too high, you can start to force water out of blood now into your tissues, and that can lead to edema. Or if you find that there's an increase in interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, like if you have a lot of solutes in your tissue, that's going to pull water out of the bloodstream into your tissue. That can also lead to edema. Okay, um, and this, could, this can also come from like an increase in vascular permeability. So what this slide is showing then are all the different mechanisms that can lead to edema. And so looking at this top slide, you guys, what this is showing is the normal processes that um, you know exist in the capillary beds of your body. Going back to A&P, we talked about this as bulk flow. And with bulk flow, there were four main processes that influenced that, right? I'm sorry, there's two main processes, but each of those two had two subcategories. So we had hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. Which of those pressures, hydrostatic or osmotic, is like a, is like a pulling force? Which one pulls water? Osmotic, good. So osmotic pressure is a pulling pressure where water gets pulled in a particular direction where there's a lot of solutes, right? And hydrostatic pressure is a pushing pressure due to fluid pressure, like blood pressure, where because of your bloodstream, it's compressed fluid, it has a tendency to want to expand, and that fluid can then can get forced out of the capillaries into your tissues, okay? So what we see here then is we got these dark arrows and some green arrows. The dark arrows here are representing capillary hydrostatic pressure. And is hydrostatic pressure a pulling force or a pushing force? Pushing, right? So you can see here, the, due to the direction of this arrow, due to blood pressure, uh, water is being pushed out of the blood vessel here, across the vessel wall, into the tissue. If capillary hydrostatic pressure was the only pressure that was involved here, we would get a lot of edema because then fluid just starts, would just start accumulating in our tissues. But we notice here in green, there's also another green pressure here. And it's an osmotic pressure. We call this capillary osmotic pressure. Is that a pulling or, or a pushing pressure? Pulling, right? And what's pulling water back in if it's capillary osmotic pressure? Albumin. So you guys see these little dots here? These dots are representing albumin. And so if you have a sufficient amount of albumin, which is a plasma protein, in your bloodstream, it'll help to pull some of that water back into the bloodstream. That way, some of the water that was pushed out can get pulled back in. Okay, so those are the two main forces here. But some other forces that can be applied to you guys would be, like this is a pushing pressure. This is actually interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, where due to some fluid pressure, you can see that the arrow is kind of small, so it indicates it's not a very large force. But due to some pushing pressure of fluid in the tissue, you can push some fluid back into your bloodstream. Okay? And you got another green arrow over here. It's also pretty small. This was representing interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. And um, it's a pulling pressure. And due to solutes in the tissue, it can help pull water back out. So you'll notice we got arrows going in, arrows going out of the blood vessel, and typically these should all be balanced pretty well. If, if these aren't balanced, then that may lead to edema, right? So let's go through some of these different factors. So we'll, let's start here, you guys. Look how big this arrow is now here. Where If this is the normal condition, you're seeing this dark arrow represents a really high capillary hydrostatic pressure. So what was capillary hydrostatic pressure again? Blood pressure, good. And if your blood pressure is high, you're going to force more water out into your tissue, which can promote edema. Where have we seen this before? 
where blood pressure is high and you start getting edema. What's that? Where have we seen this before, you guys? If blood pressure is high in your bloodstream, and it starts to force water out into tissues. With heart failure, good. With what, what side of right heart failure? Left. So left side of heart failure. And then where, where, where did the blood back up? Actually, we saw it right, I'm sorry, let, let's take that back. We saw it with right and left. So where does blood back up with right side of heart failure? Systemic veins, right? Well, it's gonna back up to capillaries too which means you're going to have more resistance, higher blood pressure, so you can force more fluid out of your bloodstream into your tissues. So what type of edema do we see with right-sided heart failure? Systemic edema. You got it. This is all over. How about with left-sided heart failure? Pulmonary edema, and that's because of an increase in pulmonary pressure, right? Because blood's backing up. But what if, what if it wasn't even heart failure? What if you just had high blood pressure? Well, you, more water can get forced out in the tissues, so that's one way you can get edema, right? Let's look over here, you guys. What if solutes now started to leave your bloodstream and enter the tissue? And those solutes act as an osmotic driving force, right? So what's the force that, uh, due to solutes then, can pull water into the tissue? Osmotic pressure. So we call this interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. And this interstitial fluid osmotic pressure can increase if you start to lose solutes into your tissues. Like let's say if these capillaries are leaky, you guys, and you start to have protein leave your bloodstream and enter a tissue, well then that protein is going to start to attract water with it. And when that water follows the protein, um, that can promote edema. What about if we look down here, you guys, where we see that there's a blocked lymph vessel. What's the normal function of lymph? Nice. To pick up excess water and then carry that back towards your bloodstream. So if this lymph vessel is blocked, where is that excess water going? Yeah, it's staying in the tissue, right? And so it's going to stay in the tissue. And that can also lead to edema due to locked, a blocked lymph vessel. Um, or what if we stopped making albumin? Like if you stop making albumin due to liver failure or if you lost albumin in your urine so that your blood albumin levels started getting lower, right? What's the normal function of albumin? Nice, to pull water back into the bloodstream. So if you don't have that force, if you start to lose albumin, what's happening here then? You got it. So you're not pulling as much albumin, I'm sorry, you're not pulling as much water back in your bloodstream because you've lost that albumin. So we're going to pick up here talking about uh, electrolytes. So they're basically ionized salts that are dissolved in water, things like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphate. Those are all electrolytes because they carry a charge. There's cations and anions. Those are all considered electrolytes. And so what this slide is showing then um, are just different ways to, uh, you know, uh, have electrolyte intake or uh, loss. So, you know, you can, you can get electrolytes from food you eat. You can lose electrolytes through sweat. You can lose electrolytes through urine or defecation. Otherwise, you can get electrolytes from, you know, IV, IV solution as well. Or even vomiting. It's not on this slide, you guys, but you can lose electrolytes through, through excessive emesis or vomiting. So, uh, you know, you can lose electrolytes through urines, feces, sweat, and vomiting or emesis. Uh, electrolyte balance is influenced by different hormones. We talked about aldosterone, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin. There's a variety of hormones that influence electrolytes. Um, so you can have a normal electrolyte loss through vomiting, Nasogastric suction, uh, paracentesis, hemodialysis, wound drainage, and fistula drainage. So the first type of electrolyte imbalance we're going to talk about is hypokalemia. So hypokalemia is low blood potassium, and this can come from decreased intake or excess secretion, either through like feces, sweat, or emesis. You can lose a lot of potassium through vomiting, or even through the excessive use of diuretics. Now, the clinical manifestations of hypokalemia, well, we know that we know that potassium is involved with the action potential, right? Because it helps repolarize the action potential. So if you have low blood potassium, then you're going to see neurological manifestations, right? Like altered neuromuscular excitability. So we find then is that we see that uh, smooth muscle contraction is altered, uh, cardiac muscle 
function will be altered um, due to resting membrane potential changing. And this both leads to hypoactivity. So smooth muscle and cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle, it's not on the slide, but those are all be underactive. So they have like muscle weakness and that kind of stuff. That comes from hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia means high blood potassium. This can come from excessive intake uh, through, you know, IV infusion. You know, like banana bags have a lot of potassium. Um, or decreased potassium excretion. So like, uh, you know, if you have low urine output or if you had potassium sparing diuretics, that kind of stuff could increase your potassium levels. But we know, again, potassium is involved with the action potential. And um, if you have high blood potassiums, this causes, this causes hyperactivity. Uh, so of muscle. So you're going to find that skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle are hyperactive. In fact, um, uh, for the heart, it becomes so hyperactive, it stays in a contracted state. So eventually it stops beating, right? It only stays contracted. It won't relax to fill with blood. So hyperkalemia stops your heart. But not because it's inhibited, because it's too excited. You get tetanus here, where it's just you have to sustain muscle contraction. And that, and that way it can be fatal. Um, hypocalcemia means low serum calcium, and this comes about from things like poor diet, lack of vitamin D, hypoparathyroidism, or increased calcium excretion, and it decreases threshold potential, which causes hyper hyper excitability, and this can lead to things like muscle twitching, cramping, and paresthesias. Uh, paresthesia is just tingling, like abnormal tingling or sensation in skin. Um, that can come about from hypocalcemia. So hypercalcemia, though, means high blood potassium or calcium, and this can come about from vitamin D overdose, hyperparathyroidism, or decreased calcium excretion. It can cause uh, a decrease in neuromuscular excitability, which can lead to things like weakness, diminished reflexes, or uh, dysrhythmias. Hypomagnesia uh, means low serum magnesium, and it's from a decrease in magnesium intake. Uh, you can see this for like chronic alcoholism, malnutrition, or uh, ileal resection. This causes increase in neuromuscular excitability from too much acetylcholine because magnesium helps stabilize acetylcholine release. And if you get too much acetylcholine being released, then um, it causes hyperexcitability of things like skeletal muscle. Uh, hypermagnesia means high blood magnesium. And uh, this can come from, again, too much intake um, or absorption from like laxatives and antacids. And this depresses neuromuscular function, so it can actually lead to a decrease in acetylcholine and neuromuscular junctions. Now, for phosphate, that's one of the aspects of ATP, right? So adenosine triphosphate is ATP. So if you have hypophosphatemia, this is where you have low phosphate levels, which means what if you had phosphate levels that were too low that you couldn't replenish ATP? Well, what's interesting is that you actually replenish your body's weight in ATP every day, right? Like you need to use ATP for, for uh, metabolism in your body, well, it's recycled and reused so many times that you actually can replace your entire body weight in ATP every day. It's how fast it's recycled. But that requires phosphate, right? Because when ATP is broken apart, it's broken into ADP, which means it's missing a phosphate. But if you have low phosphate levels in your bloodstream, then you'll have difficulty replenishing that ATP. And you can imagine all of the decreases in metabolic activity that would come as a result, right? So coma seizure, confusion, impaired cardiac function due to that loss of ATP, right? Or at least you can't regenerate ATP as well because of low plasma phosphate. What about hyperphosphatemia? Well, that's one of the substrates for ATP, right? So you can make a lot of ATP. What's going to happen then, you guys, is that with increase in phosphate intake, that can lead to increased neuromuscular excitability. So skeletal muscles will be more excited, cardiac muscles more excited, and smooth muscle as well. And that's... that's um, consistent with the uh, hypocalcemia uh, signs and symptoms.